Ladies and gentlemen, we're at the Griffith Park Zoo of Los Angeles to meet a South American explorer and to see a unique animal. The man is Mr. Eric Pavel of San Clemente, California. The animal is the vicuña, the rarest of all fleece-bearing creatures whose wool provided royal robes for the kings of the ancient Incas. Mr. Pavel will take us on a 12,000-mile journey by small car and by horse to the only place on earth where the vicuña lives, the high Andes of Peru. Here, near the fabled palaces of the Incas, and with the help of the mountain Indians, Mr. Pavel searches for and finds this prize. Tonight, Vicuña Country. Bold Journey, your television passport to the exciting, colorful world of adventure. Although times and styles have changed since the days when the Inca Indians governed a vast territory of South America, the ancient rulers and modern women share one thing in common, their admiration and desire for cloth made from the hair of the golden-fleeced vicuña. A dainty deer-like animal found at altitudes ranging from 12 to 16,000 feet high in the Andes of Peru, this little-known creature has often been called the Prince of Wool Bearers and only one person in every four million enjoys the beauty and warmth of fabrics woven from the golden brown wool of the vicuña. And our guest tonight will show us how he and his family searched for and found this rare wild animal. It's indeed a pleasure to welcome back our expert on South America, Mr. Eric Pavel of San Clemente, California. Mr. Pavel, it's nice to see you back. Glad to be here. This is quite an appropriate setting for us here today, isn't it? What with chickens over to the right, and we have vicuña to the rear. And then up on the hills, ladies and gentlemen, we have a small herd of buffalo here at the Griffith Park Zoo. One reason that we wanted so much to meet you here at the zoo was to show our audience some real live vicuña that we have in the back. And I wonder if we can't take this opportunity to have you tell us something about these creatures. The vicuña jack lives in the high Andes of Peru, and you usually will encounter some 35 to 40 in a herd. They're all females except one male that takes care of them. And whenever there is danger involved, you'll hear a whistle and all the females will start running and the male will be the last to clear the field. Well, now we mentioned just a moment ago that you and your family traveled some 12,000 miles in order to find the vicuña that we'll see in your films tonight. Now, why such a distance? Is it because they're so hard to get to? Are they so scarce, so rare? What are the reasons? Well, first we traveled all over the country to see other things too, and then when we came close to the vicuñas, everybody knew where they were approximately, but nobody knew exactly, so we went about two weeks searching for them, and the weather was not always perfect, and the miles just kept piling up. Well, now, besides this primary purpose of finding vicuña, did you have any other motives for journeying as far and as long as you did in Peru? Well, we were interested to find out how much is left of the Inca civilization as the first users of vicuña fleas were the Inca rulers. And we still found many Indian tribes that live in a primitive way of life like their forefathers hundreds of years ago. Thank you, Mr. Pavel. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here by film recording, we go to Vicuna country. Jack, the only place where vicuñas are still found in the world is high up in the Andes of Peru. My home in San Clemente. Any kind of trip usually takes weeks, if not months, of preparation. And so when we wanted to go to Peru in order to find the prized vicuñas high in the Andes, we had to ship our four-wheeler several weeks before that in order to be able to follow it by plane and find it when we arrived. And while the heavy luggage and the car was on the boat down to South America, we followed by plane to Lima and then north towards the border of Ecuador where we had our car disembarked and then we entered the country. Here we find large dunes coming down towards the ocean. The sand dunes shift frequently and the roads have to be constantly cleared. Here we also found the only foremast in the world which still works without an engine and carries guano from the islands to the mainland. A ship which at least looked like a ship turned out to be a house near the beach. And then following again the desert, we entered the city of Lima 
where we found the statue of the last Inca ruler Atahualpa, pointing towards the mountains as if showing us the way we had to follow. We followed a narrow gorge towards the Andes Mountains. This river gorge is so narrow that it took over 20 years to build a road. There are many tunnels which are one way and you always have to be careful not to meet another car inside. You see the sheer drop of the cliffs and the river winding in between with a few bridges once in a while. These bridges were built for llamas and people. But today trucks use them. And if you notice, Jack, the whole bridge is bending and twisting while the truck passes over it, and it will be just a matter of time until it collapses. We found one of these bridges that had collapsed, and the truck that was passing over it at that moment was still in the water. And then a little further on along the road, new bridges were being built by damming off the river, and the workers are carrying stones and rocks. Now the road had turned into a trail, climbing higher and higher. We still find grass growing in between, which shows us how little traffic passes over these trails. Whenever you travel in the Andes, you always have a problem to find gasoline. Once in a while, you'll see a house near the road, and if you find a 20 or 50 gallon drum in front of it, you call the woman from her cooking, she'll bring out a rubber hose, suck on one end, spit out a mouthful of gasoline, and then siphons the gasoline into a tin can, which she brings to your car, and then repeating the same process again with a rubber hose, she fills your tank. As we travel over the Puna, the Puna are these flat plateaus at around seven or 8,000 feet altitudes, we saw animals that looked like vicuyas, but turned out to be llamas. The llama is a domesticated animal which is used by the Indians to carry loads over the mountain trails. The leading animal carrying a flag of Peru on his back. The llamas, alpacas and vicuyas are of the same family. They are of the cameloid family and the llamas were known and used by the Incas hundreds of years ago. And they not only use them as pack animals, but they also use their wool to make their clothing and they use their meat for food. So the llama has become a domesticated animal and it is to the Indians in the Andes just as the horse is to the gauchos in Argentina. Here along the road we found a baby llama with his mother. <laughs> we came closer and Michel was quite excited, and so he said, can I go and pet him? Well, of course, llamas are nice and friendly animals. One of the main reasons for bringing Michel to Peru was that he loves animals. And so my wife and I were delighted to find him make friends with the llamas right away. So he came close and petted it, and then he went back to the car, and a few seconds later he brought out his teddy bear and introduced it to the baby llama. <laughs> We had reached Lake Titicaca, the highest navigable lake in the world, almost three miles above sea level. Here we find vegetation growing right under the surface of the lake, and therefore the birds and animals that live along it feed under the surface of the water, and you find the birds with long beaks. Actually, you find entire pastures right under the surface of the lake, and the Aymara Indians that live around Lake Titicaca use these pastures. They'll go out in their tortora boats and harvest the grass which grows under the water with these knives which are attached to long poles. The cow always knows where to find her breakfast. The strangest sight to us was this huge steamer on a landlocked lake almost three miles above the sea level. This steamer was sailed all the way across the ocean from Europe to the Peruvian ports, then disassembled and piece by piece were taken up the mountain trail to Lake Titicaca where they were assembled again. What a superhuman feat that must have been. Traveling along the lake, we entered a small village and over a fence my wife saw a woman which was weaving cloths. They always make their own cloths and they sometimes use alpaca wool. Vicuña is seldomly used because it is unavailable to the Indians. 
the oldest daughter was sorting potatoes while the father was out harvesting his wheat. Michel got hold of his sickle and also helped cutting some of the wheat. But next morning, Michel had his biggest surprise because he saw Father Antonio threshing the wheat by using his oxen and leading the oxen by their tail and the slightest movement to the left or the right made the animals follow. We stayed with the family several days. But there was a festival approaching. An entire family was getting ready for it. One of the sons of the Antonio family was practicing on his small guitar. And the smaller children of the family were also playing instruments. The little girl was playing with her rag doll while her brother was practicing on the flute. Those costumes certainly go back a long time, don't they? Well, they are supposed to be of Inca origin. And some of the old customs prevail, like the girls, when they have marriageable eight, they will make 13 braids. This is supposed to show that they are ready to be married. Thank you, Mr. Pavel. Part two of your true story adventure continues in just a moment. Following the trucks with the people, we passed through the ancient city of Cusco. Cusco used to be the capital of the Inca Empire. Many of its churches today are built on ruins that were ancient Inca temples. And close by you find the city of Machu Picchu. This was the last refuge of the Incas. It's an entire city built of rocks. A city almost two miles high in the mountains. The Spanish never found it and it remained undiscovered until the 20th century when it was found here by an American, Hiram Bingham. Nobody really can explain how this city was ever built. These large rocks and boulders had to be carried for many miles, and they had to be cut, and nobody knows how these have been cut so perfectly. Some of these boulders fit so closely one to another that it is impossible to even bring a blade in between, and there is no mortar used. Here is also the only Inca sundial which is still existent in Peru. The Spanish conquistadores destroyed these sundials, but they never discovered Machu Picchu and therefore you still find it here. Climbing still higher, we finally reached the village where that festival was going to take place. Along the way, we found large alpaca herds. The alpaca is of the same family as the llama and the vicuña. However, the alpaca is raised only for its fur. You notice that the alpacas are very much smaller than the llamas and they are also chubbier. And today they try to raise mainly the white alpaca because the white wool brings the highest price. The alpacas are extremely curious animals. Whenever you come close, they stop and look at you. All three animals, alpacas, vicuñas, and llamas, live above 8,000 feet. Actually, most of them are very close to the snow line. Every morning, the Indians will take their alpaca herds into the mountains for grazing. And some of the families may have as many as two or three hundred animals. They'll spend their day high up in the mountains around these lakes and then be taken back again in the evening. The village with the fiesta was in excitement. The women trade and buy at the market while the men talk about their crops and llamas. We found many stores that hang an alpaca fur on their door showing that they are selling fur and wool. A pachamanca was being prepared. A pachamanca is a feast which dates back to Inca times. A stone pyramid is built a fire inside heats up the stones and with green branches they always keep these stones clean. And then the food appears and as soon as the stones are hot enough the whole pyramid will be broken down and now the ingredients to the pachamanca will be filled into that hole. And now for the recipe. First a sack of potatoes. Then a few hot stones on top. Then the meat of the two or three sheep well spiced and salted. Then another few hot stones on top of that. And then the so-called ayacas. 
The ayakas are corn patties wrapped in corn leaves. Place some herbs on top for flavor. And then a sack of string beans. This is starting to look like a Peruvian Irish stew, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's a huge stew anyway. Now the whole thing will be covered with burlap bags and then some earth on it. Pachamanca means food of Mother Earth. And to make it successful, they'll plant a small cross on top. And now your pachamanca is ready. Two or three hours later, they'll break the whole hill down, take off the burlap bags, and then the whole problem is getting the meat and the potatoes out in between the hot stones without burning your fingers. And after all this work, it really tasted delicious. Here we found also two wise parrots. At least I suppose they were wise because they were telling the fortune of people. If you gave the man a penny, he would take one of these parrots down, it will pick out a small piece of paper, and you read your fortune. It will tell you how many children you will have, how much money you will make, how long you will live. Michel's paper said that he would have good fortune. Usually you find quacks on these marketplaces. This one was dressed like an Indian and he claimed to be one. He took a man from the audience and said, this man has water in his lungs, like so many of you. Water in the lungs usually means TB. He showed a knife on the back of this man and said, well, I could cut his back and take the water out, and that is probably what a doctor would do, and it would cost you a lot of money. But you can do it much cheaper if you buy one of my medicines. This is real snake medicine, which comes from the jungles. It is a prescription that was handed down by my forefathers. And if you buy it, it will only cost you a few pennies, and he showed how much it would cost by placing each bottle on top of a coin. They were only discarded penicillin bottles filled with ordinary pork fat. Well, while this was happening, the man was standing in the sun, and of course, water was on his back. So he wiped off the water and said, look at all the water that has come out of his lungs. He said, my medicine has brought this water out of his lungs. Finally, as a last gesture, he gave these bottles to his assistant for selling and walked off in dignity. In the meantime, the music has started, the crowds were larger, the whole plaza was filled with them, and the devil's dancers started performing. The devil's dancers actually come from Bolivia, but they have spread out all over Peru, the devil's mask, of course, being the trademark of the devil's dancers. Now, would those soldiers, the men looking like soldiers, represent the Spanish? They would, at least they imitate the Spanish because the Indians have never really forgiven the Spanish for conquering the Inca Empire and whenever they can ridicule the Spanish they would do so because you see they are dressed not only like soldiers but a little bit like women they have this sort of skirt and they are richly embroidered because the Spanish in those times used to have wigs and their dresses were at least in the eyes of the Indians effeminated the women wear seven or eight skirts, one on top of the other, and usually the newest one is on top. And when they dance to the left and to the right, and these skirts swing, they almost look like dolls. These dances last not for hours, but for days. And it is quite grueling, especially for the devil himself, who wears his mask, which weighs about four to five pounds. We were told that Vicuñas were very close and a nestanciero in the vicinity promised to give us horses and also to send his son and daughter-in-law along to show us the way. And so one morning we left on horseback crossing the river near the estancia and then started to climb. And higher and higher we climbed almost to the snow line. Along the way we met llama packs that were coming back carrying alpaca wool. The alpaca wool in this part of the country is the only way of making a livelihood for the Indians. And we entered what is called Keros country. An old Keros was sitting in front of his house, was chewing coca. Coca is a leaf, which is actually a drug. He was taking the leaves out of a small vicuña bag, and then chewing it, he would gain energy and resist the cold. Chewing coca is found all over the Andes in Peru, Ecuador, and as far down as Bolivia and Chile. We asked him about vicuñas, and he told us that he would tell us exactly where they were. But first, he said, we had to perform the first haircut of his grandchild. The first haircut here in the Andes is a very important event. 
and usually a family tries to find an influential person to do it. Actually, the baby was almost a year and a half old and never had a haircut before. And so the daughter-in-law of the estanciero had the honors of cutting the hair of this child. A rusty scissor appeared from I don't know where, and more pulling than cutting, this long hair was cut. Well, after the wife had done some of the cutting, I was asked to cut too, and of course I had to give a small gift to that baby. Mother seemed to be very pleased. She smiled all during the process. And then each member of the family, including the father and the grandfather and the uncles, came closer and had to cut some of these black locks. It's a sort of symbolic ritual, in other words. Yes. Mm -hmm. And here was baby after his first haircut. Completely shorn. But he seemed to like it, and everybody was quite impressed about it. Father was very serious. Three of his brothers were sitting around, and they saw this was perfect. Although the oldest daughter of the family thought it was somewhat funny. Well, the old Keros kept his promise, and he said that his son would come along with us and show us where we would find the Cunhas. We only had one day's ride, and then as we came around some large rocks, the Indian said, look there, you see the snow line? We said, yes, we see the snow line. He said, now turn your head to the right, and there between the rocks you'll see some Vicunas. Well, at first I didn't see anything because they were there without moving. But then looking closer, we actually saw the Vicunas. Well, I was quite excited because we had traveled almost 12,000 miles for over three months, and finally we had found the Vicunas. And not one or two or three as I expected, but a full herd of them. There were about 30 or 40, and then I found out that Vicunas always live in herds of that quantity, one male and about 35 to 40 females. And the male will fight over his herd with other males until he kills the other male and then is the only male in that herd. How smooth their coats are. Their fleece is soft as down. They live at 10,000, 11,000 feet high, some of them around 16,000, 17,000. And the reason why the Vicuña wool is so high priced is that they are so difficult to catch. We had found llamas, alpacas, and after this long journey, the prized Vicuña. We could understand now why the Vicuña fur is so valuable. Thank you very much, Mr. Pavel. You don't happen to have a few dozen of those Vicuña pelts, do you? Oh, you just have to turn around in the back of you. <laughs> I'm afraid the zoo wouldn't spare these two, I think. They're the only two Vicuña that they have here in the entire Griffith Park Zoo. Now, although you were born in South America, Mr. Pavel, and perhaps you're somewhat acclimated with the uh, high altitudes and the high, high atmospheres, how about your wife and particularly your son, Michelle? How did they bear up? Well, we all had our problems once we reached around 12,000, especially the first few days climbing stairs in hotels and lugging our luggage upstairs. But then after about a week, it seems to disappear. Was this little Michelle's first journey with you and your wife? Well, no, we have been in Argentina the year before and in Ecuador two years before that. He's going to be a well-traveled young man, isn't he? I am so. Now, let's talk about the Keros Indians, whom we saw tonight for the first time in our series in your fine films, Mr. Pavel. Are they by any chance descended from the Incas? It is believed so, Jack, because the way of the dressing is very much alike the Incas had. And then, as it is said, that most of the Indians in Peru are descendants of the Incas. Well, actually, the way that we saw the food being prepared for that Pachamanca feast, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, would seem to indicate perhaps a closer tie between the Caros and the Polynesians. Well, of course, it's a general belief that there is a relationship between the South American Indian and the Polynesian people, but that I wouldn't know much about it because I've never been in Polynesia. That's probably the only place in the world you haven't been, Mr. Pavel, and once again, we're indebted to you for the very fine films that we saw and enjoyed tonight, Vicuna Country. Thanks again, and I hope we'll see you real soon on our Bull Journey series. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Thank mm -hmm. you.